Good morning and welcome to the last day of uh, our conference uh, uh, in spring 2022. I hope you all had uh, a pleasant evening yesterday and uh, are uh, fully refreshed so that we can start anew with uh, uh, this uh, panel, panel four. How have national jurisdictions dealt with international crimes committed on their own territories? And we have a distinguished panel which uh, will start uh, in a minute. Uh, it will be uh, led by Clémence uh, Betatre and she will introduce uh, herself and uh, her panelists uh, as well because I wasn't prepared to make the opening so I don't have your CV in front of me. So I hope you forgive me for that. <laughs> and without further ado, I'm looking forward to interesting discussions also for this day. Thank you so much for being with us and thank you for uh, sharing this panel. Thank you so much. So let's start. Um, hello everyone. Um, I'd like first of all to thank the organizers, the Nuremberg Academy of course and the Genocide Network for organizing um, um, this important conference. I think it's always great for all of us to have that kind of opportunity to take a step aside and reflect upon uh, the current challenges in the search for accountability. Um, the panel this morning um, will try to provide answers to the following question, how have national jurisdictions dealt with international crimes committed on their own territories? Um, I would say that is, it is a crucial question and let me allow perhaps to share a few introduction notes before giving the floor to my esteemed colleagues and panelists. Um, in a great variety of situations and in the majority of the cases trying to bring justice processes in the territorial state where the crimes have occurred is an absolute goal and priority for victims and survivors. Not only because of the immediate effects of that kind of justice process taking place in the territorial state, closer to the victims, closer to the suspects, uh, assuring wider participation of victims, assuring a greater number of suspects to be sanctioned, and victims to access and affected communities as a whole to access justice and effective remedies. But this um, justice processes, when they happen in the territorial state, can also have a wider impact on a given situation of impunity. And when I say wider impact, I'm thinking about changes in national legislations uh, for greater conformity with international standards, um, but also um, building on the expertise and the capacity of a national justice system to answer or address the question of impunity, <laughs> maybe in a wa wider situation of uh, cases. And also enhancing the independence of the justice system and favoring the rule of law in a general sense. But it also remains full of challenges, of course, because in many circumstances, the ones holding the power are also the perpetrators of international crimes or still hold a very important political influence. And also in many occasions, the fight against impunity is seen as having a too high political cost. And let me share with you a precise example, as I have worked in Ivory Coast with victims, with FIDH victims, survivors of the post-electoral crisis of 2010 and 2011, where we were all, um, well, seeing with a lot of hope and enthusiasm the initial very strong commitments of President Ouattara in favor of the fight against impunity um, that diminished uh, over the years and that finally led to an amnesty decree that was ratified by a legislation and that put a final end to all prosecutions that had been initiated very courageously, I must say, by the national justice system in Ivory Coast. There are so many also examples um, of that kind of um, political political willingness waving down over the years. And of course, this is always a key question when you try to see justice, um, not only at the national level, but including in the territorial state. Um, and in light today of the tremendous challenges that the Ukrainian justice system is facing, I think it is maybe more important and essential um, to be link looking into past and current experiences um, and to see how we can learn from successes but also from failures of trying to seek justice in the territorial state before uh, national justice systems. So we will hear today about experience from Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Rwanda, DRC and the Gambia. And I will first give the floor to uh, David Schwendingman. Um, David, um, 
Uh, apart from being a great boss, which we, I think we all learned yesterday during panel two, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> you no started. <laughs> it is a good information to have, David. You started your career as a prosecutor and executive prosecutor at the U.S. Department of Justice, and for almost ten years after that, you served as an investigator, prosecutor, and executive prosecutor engaged in the investigation and prosecution of international crimes committed in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. Um, David, could you share with us your practical and maybe also personal experience as a prosecutor on the setting up of the war crime chambers in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the specialist court and specialist prosecutor's office uh, within the Kosovo court system and the challenges that you have experienced? David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, Bill, let me take a moment and thank Klaus and Jennifer and Frauke and the staff for the great way they've taken care of us uh, over the last couple of days. It's very much appreciated. And I want to thank Klaus because I want to get a chance to do this publicly um, before this is over. He was a great colleague in The Hague. He was an occasional lunch partner at the Dutch Telephone Cafeteria. He was a real estate agent of sorts because he helped us move into abandoned ICC premises when we moved to The Hague from Brussels. and. Uh, He's a friend. So as for retirement, Klaus, I've made a big deal of beekeeping. It's not a joke. They sting you on occasion to remind you of that. But I will say, uh, all joking aside, that being retired is really not being retired, not in this work. Uh, it's always with you. You'll always be with it. You'll always be a resource, uh, just like Navi and Steve and everybody else that's sitting in this room, Sylvia. Um, I'm honored to be here with the people that are on this panel because I'm the old guy and these people, they're the new people. They're the people that are actually in the work now and will carry the work into the future. My role here, uh, as much as it can be of value, is for talking about two very important experiments that I was part of and it had something to do with both in the creation and the operation of during my 10, little over 10 years worth of work in this area. Work I left in 2018. So again, I'm sort of caught between the historians that spoke yesterday and the practitioners that are going to speak today, but I think I can give you some insight uh, from experience. And experience imposes some duties, and one of them is to talk about what you've done so that if there is some value from it, it can be extracted. I have to say this, I'm no longer in a position that compels me to make prosecution decisions. My observations are not informed by the responsibility to charge and prosecute. I have no inside information about what's going on in the International Criminal Court or what's happening with the U.S. Department of Justice or the State Department or in Ukraine's Prosecutor General's Office. My observations, if they have application to those situations, are not informed by insider information. Um, I will say one thing about uh, Ukraine's Prosecutor General, um, Irina Benediktovna who I've watched, uh, I think, accept extraordinary responsibility, exhibit great bravery and courage in stepping up to take on the obligations that she knows she's going to have. She has to have, as we've heard over and over in these last couple of days, appropriate, adequate, and most importantly, and I know this from my work as a Special Inspector General for Afghanistan uh, Reconstruction, she must have sustained and sustainable support in order to meet the obligations she's taken on. She's in the middle of a storm right now. Uh, I know she's the center of a great deal of national and international attention, media attention in particular, much needed and, and very appropriate media attention. But I know from personal experience in the work that I've done that that's going to end sometime. Um, and uh, the thing that's not going to end is her being pulled in a million different directions by a million different obligations and requirements imposed by us, by the international community, by the domestic people that are audience that she has to satisfy, the constituents she needs to deal with, and by others. 
Uh, it's going to be a major personal, I know that from experience as well, professional and in, a test for her, but also an institutional test and a personal test for her office and her prosecutors. And one thing we haven't discussed in the last couple of days is how to take care of the people that are doing the work while they're doing the work and as that work piles on them, both emotionally and uh, from a physical point of view. I'm not a scholar, um, as um, Clements noted, uh, for 25 years I was a prosecutor, an executive prosecutor in the Department of Justice, and then uh, went to Bosnia and Herzegovina and went to Afghanistan and then eventually went to Kosovo when Steve asked me to go. Um, I was responsible while I was in those jobs to some extent for helping shape the domestic, political, and the donor environments within which those offices that I was responsible for uh, had to work and for acquiring and more importantly maintaining the resources that those offices needed to have in order to do the work they were expected to do. I had some responsibility for setting policy in places where there was no policy uh, for creating um, rules to govern practice, to try and come up with guidelines for prosecutors so that we could apply them neutrally and we could do our work objectively, which is all part of uh, uh, achieving integrity, but also achieving um, legitimacy and a perception of legitimacy for the work that you're doing. Um, also had responsibility for helping to organize the work, which is really problematic when you think about it. Selecting and prioritizing the cases that you're going to do is both a political and a legal act. Uh, political in the sense that you are torn between, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, three constituencies. The Bosniak constituency, the Croat constituency, and the Serb constituency. Each one wants you to do more of their work than your resources would allow you to do even on the best day. In order to make it appear that you are as fair as possible, you have to come up with criteria that you can explain to each one of those constituencies in a way that they will understand it. Not in some complicated legalistic way, not in some document that you can just hand them and hope they will understand, but in common sense in common terms that um, they can argue with, but at least understand. Then you have to apply those criteria, not only objectively, but even handedly. And it has to appear that they're being uh, applied in it, in it, even handedly. So again, that was one of the tasks that I took on in Bosnia and Herzegovina because when I got there, there was a large caseload, but no way to sort it out, uh, other than the way that the ICTY had sorted it out when they had sent the cases back to Bosnia and Herzegovina pursuant to the completion strategy. There were only a few of those cases, 13 I think in the beginning, that were what were called Rule 11 BIS cases that were sent back by the ICTY to Bosnia and Herzegovina because they had been indicted but couldn't go to trial before the date specified in the completion strategy. There were about 40 other cases that were considered high profile cases, um, which had been investigated to a certain degree, but were not able to be indicted before the time period specified by the completion strategy. There were some assumptions made about those cases that they were ready to go to trial and that all we had to do is convert them into a Bosnian indictment and then you know everything would be fine. That was not the case. The cases weren't fully investigated. They weren't investigated to the degree that the Bosnian law would have required that they be investigated in order for them to be indicted. So we had to restart those cases, essentially. And then we were sent about 4,000 what were called rules of the road files. The rules of the road files were files that had been sent to the ICTY because during the conflict, the different constituencies began prosecuting people for different reasons. One, to kind of get to people before others could so that they could do away with the cases. Others, because they wanted to persecute people and use the judicial system to do it. 
And the ICTY decided under what they called the rules of the road that all those cases now had to be sent to the ICTY to be vetted. And what happened was most of those cases, not all of them, were just held on to. Uh, nothing was done uh, to them or with them for pretty much the entire period of the ICTY's existence. But at the end of the completion, uh, at, during the completion strategy's execution, those were just bound up and sent all back to us. Uh, and those had to be dealt with in a much different way. So I'll get in a minute to how we organized that, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, Kosovo for OISA's benefit um, especially. Um, Kosovo is a very different situation than Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia and Herzegovina had an existing judiciary that was at least functioning, and functioning rather well at the time that the completion strategy was put into place. As part of the completion strategy, the Security Council encouraged nations, compelled nations in many ways, to help Bosnia and Herzegovina build their judiciary, build their prosecution service, strengthen its ability to do the work that they were going to have sent back to them. Um, the international community stepped up. Uh, they helped create the, the, the Special Department for War Crimes in, this, in the State Prosecutor's Office. They helped create the War Crimes Chambers in the State Court, which were dedicated specifically to dealing with these kinds of cases. And they also built a courthouse, uh, built out the courthouse so that it could be used by international prosecutors and judges working together with alongside their domestic colleagues. So there were translation services that had to be, um, translation facility that had to be created, interpretation facility that had to be created. Um, translators and language assistants that had to be given to the judges and to the prosecutors so that they could engage with witnesses, so that they could go out in the field, so they could do what they needed to do. People that became trusted uh, assistants who knew best how to get your message across to the people that needed to hear it. I will mention that that's one of the very important things about all of what we're talking about if you've got international involvement. If you don't have people that can translate and interpret for you, and that can get your message through the way it's supposed to go through, you're basically wasting your breath. Um, you will cause more con confusion and cause more difficulty than you will solve. Um, so, Kosovo. In 2010, at the time of the release of the Council of Europe's report on possible violations of international humanitarian law committed by Kosovar Albanians in 1998, 99, and 2000, what's known as the Marti Report, Kosovo's judiciary and prosecution service were not robust, to say the least. They were wards of the international community, principally the European Union, which helped them function investigated and tried problematic cases. The international community was trying corruption, organized crime, and some war crimes cases in Kosovo, and assisted the local authorities in their development efforts. The EU did this through ULEX, its rule of law mission in Kosovo. After the report came out, the EU called the Marti Report, called for further investigation to determine whether there was evidence to support prosecuting anyone for what Marti had concluded in the report. And to be fair, a large part of the report dealt with organ trafficking, which would have been the, the, um, the incentive, really, for Marti to, to be asked by the Council of Europe to do the report. Um, whether Kosovo was truly willing to do the kind of investigation that would have been necessary, a credible investigation, was a question given, that was a question given the political prominence and influence of some of those named in the report. Uh, ULEX, for its own sake, had its own problems with um, how it was viewed by Kosovars. The perception of ULEX, justified or not, fostered concerns that any outcome it might achieve by investigating such a politically fraught matter would not be seen as legitimate by those it affected, including both Serbs and Kosovars. 
if international assistance was going to be forthcoming for this kind of investigation, the donors wanted to be satisfied that the investigation will hold up to scrutiny and to the battering it was going to receive, no matter what the result was, by those in Kosovo. Under the circumstances, international donors just were not interested in giving money or to support or risk funding anything controlled by either ULEX or Kosovo. Policymakers, including uh, Ambassador Rapp and the European Union, settled on a special investigative task force as a modem for doing this investigation. The EU Special Investigative Task Force, the SITF, was created in 2011. It was placed under the general umbrella of ULEX for logistics purpose, for political support, and uh, just to ease it into existence. It was wisely lodged outside of Kosovo in Brussels and kept independent of ULEX except for this political, financial, administrative, and some operational and logistics support. It was set up to work outside of existing institutions in Kosovo and staffed with internationals rather than Kosovars to meet concerns over the potential influence that might have been brought to bear by the political leaders in Kosovo, some of whom were named in the Marti report, and to address the effect any direct involvement of Kosovo or ULEX might have done the perceived credibility of the conclusions reached by the investigation. The U.S. agreed to send ambassador, uh, former Ambassador Clint Williamson, who held the job that Steve and Beth Van Schack uh, now holds. Um, and he began that work in Brussels in 2011. I took up for Ambassador uh, Williamson when Ambassador or when Ambassador Williamson left, I took up the work that he left in 2014. Uh, I got there in 2015. In April 2014, based on the work that the task force had done, there was enough information of credible, um, uh, enough credible information to warrant the EU and Kosovo entering into an agreement to create a special court and a special prosecutor's office. Now, it's not called the special court and it's not called the special prosecutor's office because in the Kosovo constitution, special courts and special prosecutors are outlawed. So it's called the specialist court and the specialist prosecutor's office. And that's significant because every, as Steve will tell you, every tiny little thing that um, might have been picked on by those that strenuously opposed the creation of any of this was used and exploited to make it difficult to get to a conclusion with regard to the arrangements for all of this. Um, what's important about this is that Kosovo, Kosovo and the EU entered into the agreement. Now there was considerable pressure brought to bear on Kosovo to do it and they were in a position to almost have to do it, but it's important that Kosovo did do it, that it wasn't brought to them and imposed on them by the United Nations or by any other international organization. It was Kosovo that agreed with the EU to create the institutions necessary to try whatever came out of the investigative task force work and to do it in a certain fashion. That is to say, to do it outside of Kosovo in a in institutions that mirrored Kosovo judiciary and judicial institutions, but were staffed entirely by internationals, where the documentation that was collected, the evidence that was, um, that was collected, was placed outside of and maintained outside of Kosovo. Why? So that those in Kosovo that were inclined could not get to witness names, to get to uh, specific evidence that they might use to compromise the, the investigation of the cases. Um, all filings, again, sensitive records were kept outside of um, of Kosovo. Um, the other thing that's important is that the Kosovo Assembly, dragged kicking and screaming into the night, uh, did eventually pass special legislation 
and a constitutional amendment that permitted these institutions to exist, but also adopted a lex specialis, a special law that outlined the crimes that could be dealt with by these institutions. And they adopted, for the most part, the language of the Rome Statute for each of the substantive crimes with the exception of genocide. Uh, and cleverly, those who created the, the, the special legislation incorporated international customary criminal law as part of the substantive mandate which we believed under the circumstances if it were warranted would cover genocide. Uh, as a practical matter, genocide was never really a, a contemplated crime in any case. So by way of just sort of ending, um, Kosovo, we, we moved the Kosovo Prosecutor's Office to The Hague in 2016. The court moved shortly after we moved to The Hague and established ourselves in premises that Klaus helped arrange in the old administrative offices of the ICC across from the, the what do they call that thing? The, the old bridge building. The Ark. The Ark, that's the one. Yeah, right. Um, they have now, since, moved their operation into the brand new courtroom, a uh, brand new courthouse and facility out not very far from the ICC's campus. And they are now engaged in trying the indictments that have been brought by Jack Smith, who replaced me in 2018. So um, I would say, we so that the idea is a good one under the circumstances, but the EU really came to it uh, reluctantly. Not the political side, I think the political side was fully engaged and fully interested in doing it, but the European Commission felt strongly that it was pushing Lisbon way too far to take on the construction of a court and a prosecutor's office to do this kind of thing. Now whether it's something that the EU will agree to enter into in some form or another when it comes to Ukraine, I think, will to a large extent depend on how they, the residual feeling they have about what they did with the Kosovo Specialist uh, Chambers and the Kosovo Specialist Prosecutor's Office. So with that, I'll end, uh, probably run over a little bit, but, but I encourage and ask you to ask questions about the specifics when we get to the question period and maybe uh, talk a little bit more about the themes that we've talked about for the last couple of days as they apply to these two experiments. That is legitimacy and the perception of legitimacy. How do you acquire it? How do you maintain it? Do you do it through legislation? You obviously do it through the way you operate. Uh, cooperation, collaboration, and access, which becomes incredibly difficult when you're talking about something, a country to country kind of thing. But in the case of Kosovo, for example, we were dealing with a peacekeeping operation that came into Kosovo. We were dealing with military intelligence. We were dealing with military operations. We were dealing with diplomatic missions that had come into Kosovo and had all spent time on the ground while everything was going on in 98, 99, and 2000, who had relationships with the leadership in one way or another that were critical for us to understand so that we could build a case if we needed to using those people as witnesses right up to Madeleine Albright if we needed to use Madeleine Albright as a witness. Now getting uh, countries to liberate those people so that we could go talk to them and actually depose them was very difficult, very problematic. I fought for the entire three years I was there to get the US to liberate intelligence products that had been created during the time of the US involvement in Kosovo. And we'd go from agency to agency to agency and then back to the agency and agency and agency and then back to them again and again. That's gonna happen in Ukraine, I absolutely guarantee it. They're great about talking about sharing it now, but when the push comes to shove, in the end, they're gonna to wanna to protect sources and methods, and you're gonna have a very difficult time getting what they might have that might be of value to you. So collaboration, access, cooperation is another matter. Um, witness protection is a huge issue, and we can talk about that a little bit. And then um, 
finally just um, protecting the integrity and the value of this kind of thing for, the, for its future use and how that needs to be done. Anyway, enough from me. Thank you so much, uh, David, for this very rich presentation and also for pointing out what could be subjects for questions and discussion uh, a little bit later um, after the, all of the presentations. I'll now give the floor to uh, Vincent Nonzima. Um, Vincent, you are a part of the National Prosecution Authority in Rwanda. Um, and I would like to ask you, um, in your point of view, what has been um, the conditions to put in place um, a national justice effort in Rwanda to tackle um, especially the genocide in 1993 genocide. Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be with you today. I'm going to share the Rwandan experience in dealing with uh, international crimes after the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. After the genocide committed against the Tutsi in 1994, La Rwanda, like many other countries, did not have an appropriate legal framework for international crimes. In a context where there is a pressing need to render justice, Rwanda adopted a law in 1996 that was aimed at organizing trials for, a, for the suspected perpetrators. Under this law, the suspects were div divided into four, four groups. Category number one uh, was made up by the planners, organizers, in instigators, supervisors, uh, the authorities at the national level, provincial level, uh, district level, uh, also in this category, we do have notorious murderer uh, who distinguish himself in, uh, in the environment where he lived and wherever he went because of the zeal that characterized his, uh, his involvement in killings. Also, in that category, we do have the person who committed act of sexual torture. That was the category number one. The category number two was made up by the co-author, the accomplices, uh, of intentional homicide or serious attacks against persons re resulting in death. The category number three was made up the person who has committed a criminal act or criminal participation making him guilty of other serious harm to the person, to the victim. And the last category, the category number four, uh, uh, was for the persons who got involved in committing offenses against properties. This law of 1996 did not last for long. Why? Because uh, it was noted that the ordinary court for the ordinary court, it was not, not possible to handle to deal with, the, with of all those uh, mountains of cases. Uh, therefore, uh, it, uh, the Rwandan government found it important to think about uh, an alternative for uh, rendering justice to victims. After some time, it was noted that with the ordinary court, the trial of all the presumed genocide will take several decades whereas justice had to be rendered, not only for the thousands of victims, widows, orphans, but also for the thousands of detainees who were waiting for uh, their fate to be determined. It was urgent also to think about the reunification of the Rwandan society, which had been so divided a society whose members were once united by strong cultural ties, but whose trust had been deeply affected by the hate speech and the genocide against the Tutsi. 
It was in this context that the idea of Gachata Court, a traditional conflict resolution mechanism came out. In the preamble of the law establishing Gachata Courts, it is stated as follows. Considering the need in order to achieve reconciliation and justice in Rwanda, to eradicate forever the culture of impunity and adopt provisions allowing for the prosec prosecution and judgment of the authors and the accomplices without aiming only at simple repression, but also the rehabilitation of Rwandan society decomposed by the bad leaders who incited the population to exterminate a part of, of this society. The church judges were chosen by the population itself among the people known for their integrity in the village. The Gachata court had not completely supplanted the ordinary court in the sense that the, sus the suspect of the first category have remained within the jurisdiction of the latter. Therefore, Rwanda had a two parallel system. Gachata has produced a new, uh, enormous positive result that no ordinary system would achieve in the same context and the same period of time. Apart from the thousands of judgment, they have also contributed to revealing the truth about the execution of the genocide, promoting reconciliation and the social cohesion through apologies. Without the gachacha, much of the truth about the genocide would never be known. Today, the archive of gachacha court continues to play an important role for investigation carried out by international derogatory commissions from different countries. Gachacha courts were closed in 2012 after the tremendous work of two million judgment. After the closing of the Gachacha court, the new suspects are judged by ordinary courts. In 2012, Rwanda adopted a new penal code in which international crimes were fully incorporated as they are defined at international level. This, benef uh, this is very, very beneficial for judges, lawyers, prosecutors, and others in the sense that the crimes and their constituent elements have been well defined by international bodies. Today, Rwanda practitioners do not hesitate to refer to judgment rendered by international tribunals while dealing uh, with their, their cases. At institutional level, a lot has been done in order to modernize the Rwandan judicial system in relation to international crimes. A department of international crimes has been created in the prosecution, within the prosecution. The, uh, that department had the following mandate, to investigate and prosecute international crimes, to track down genocide, uh, genocide suspects wherever they are hiding, to write an international arrest warrant uh, and indictment to be sent to the country hosting the suspect. The work, the, those uh, members of the, that international department uh, uh, in Rwanda work closely with international rogatory commissions while dealing, uh, while conducting investigations in relation to international crimes. In the judiciary, a specialized chamber for international crimes was established within the High Court. This specialized chamber of High Court has jurisdiction to try at first instance cases transferred to Rwanda from the International Tribunal for Rwanda, mechanism for international crime uh, tribunals, or transferred by court of other uh, countries. The specialized chamber uh, of High Court has also jurisdiction over all persons, including foreign nationals, non-government organization or association, whether national or a foreign, alleged to have committed within or outside the territory of Rwanda genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. As I conclude, the Rwandan justice system has endured many challenges. He continued to improve and now he's more credible than ever. This is 
why you continue to receive suspects who are extradited from countries that are determined to eradicate impunity, particularly in relation to international crimes. I would mention Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands, USA, Denmark, Canada, and ICTR. Thank you very much. I am sorry I was supposed to present in French, and uh, I'm sure you, the message was, has been <laughs> delivered. <laughs> yes, it was. I think we can all confirm that. Thank you so much uh, for this presentation and for hmm? presenting to us the... <laughs> My friend? <laughs> Thank you, Vincent, for presenting to us the um, characteristics of what we can maybe call the Rwandan solution um, and also the wider impact that it had within the, the Rwandan judiciary. Um, I'll now turn to Daniele Perisi. Daniele, you are uh, working for Trial International. Uh, you head the Great Lakes program at Trial International, which encompasses the activities in DRC, but also Burundi. Um, and I would like to hear from you uh, this morning, Daniele, especially maybe from an NGO perspective about your experience in DRC and the dynamics that have been put in place to trigger domestic prosecutions on international crimes in DRC. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Clemence. And I'm really honored to be on this panel. I'm uh, humbled to be speaking before such an inspiring audience. And I'm really happy to be able to share with you some uh, key ingredients, which are, in my mind, the key ingredients of the positive complementarity ecosystem to use Ambassador Rapp's wording, uh, that, that has been developed in the last six, seven years in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, my, the, the whole thesis of my presentation is that even in countries plagued by ongoing armed conflicts like DRC, it is possible to generate a dynamic in which international actors and institutions working together with local partners can facilitate the work of the domestic judicial authorities, producing actually unprecedented results in the fight against impunity for international crimes. And to get a better sense of what I mean by, by results, I want to take the example of one province of the 26 provinces of DRC, South Kivu. In South Kivu, uh, between 2006, that is the year of the first international crime prosecution in the country, up until 2015, there, was, there had been an average of one trial per year, and I'm counting both first instance and, and appeals trials. Since 2016, the average per year has gone up to four trials, with a peak of eight trials in South Kivu in 2018. And I'm talking about mass crimes trials. Most of these cases have an average of around 100 victims, 100 civil parties in the proceedings. And uh, the defendants varying from uh, members of armed groups, uh, Congolese army soldiers, sometimes Congolese army officers, local politicians. And one peculiarity that I want to also highlight is that there have been cases in which the judicial proceedings for international crimes have not only punished past actions, which is kind of the norm for international criminal justice, but have been instrumental to stop ongoing mass criminality. So the question becomes, how, how was that possible? What made this uh, momentum possible? And I would submit to you, which are in, in my mind, those which are in my mind um, the key ingredients, for achieving these results, and some of them are actually themes that have run through the presentation of previous panelists, even in the, in the previous couple of days. First ingredient, appropriate legislative framework. In 2015, after many years of, of advocacy by civil society, Congolese legis legislative um, enacted um, a piece of law domesticating the Rome Statute, uh, basically integrating almost verbatim the elements of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, as well as the modes of criminal liability into Congolese legislation. So that was an important milestone. Second ingredient, national policy. 
In 2015, the Congolese government organized um, the Etat Généraux de la Justice, so this big conference gathering all justice stakeholders, international partners, donors, community, and this conference spurred the creation of La Politique Nationale de Reforme de la Justice, so basically the national justice sector reform, and within that reform, thanks to the lobbying of civil society, of NGOs, associations of victims, the fight against impunity for grave crimes was inscribed officially as one of its four main pillars of the justice reform. So this gave a tremendous political clout for all the actors that were going to work on uh, the fight against imp impunity for international crimes. Then, third ingredient, prosecution strategy. Of course, in, 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 uh, in a country like DRC, especially with enormous logistical challenges and, and, and with the sheer number of, of, of crimes committed, the establishment of a sound uh, prosecution strategy is key. So between 2014 and 2016, a series of workshops were held, uh, gathering together the national justice authorities, the provincial justice authorities, and all the international partners working on the fight against impunity. Out of these workshops, a set of criteria was established, and after that, in each province, the provincial justice authorities went through the work of uh, drafting a list of priority cases, around 20, 30 priority cases, that uh, uh, should be handled in the uh, coming years. And that those uh, provincial priority lists were also endorsed by the national prosecuting authorities and became basically a, a framework guiding the investigations and, and channeling the deployment of, of resources. They were also flexible enough to accommodate new cases and they were to be um, updated every year in order to evaluate the progress of cases and also move cases be, um, within the list according to the realities on, on the ground. Fourth ingredient, um, operational coordination in the deployment of expertise and resources. How many times have we heard about the importance of coordination these days? It, yeah, rightly so. I think this is the single most important factor. And in DRC, actually, the, the coordination might be seen as really the coalescing of all international and local partners around the Congolese justice authorities. Concretely, this is achieved by establish, the establishment of semi-formal structures of coordination among justice authorities, international and local partners. These, these structures are called task force, International Criminal Justice Task Force, in, in each province. And something is, is very interesting to note here, and that speaks to the um, ingenuity or the, the, the creativity sometimes of legal solutions. So these task forces are, have an institutional foundation, and that boosts their legitimacy and their effectiveness. Because acting under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, the UN Security Council mandated MONUSCO, the peacekeeping mission in, in DRC, to establish units um, whose mandate was to provide support, provide advice, basically accompany the Congolese uh, justice system in the investigation and prosecution of international crimes. And basically that was really formally spelled out in, in the MOU between the, the Congolese government and, and, and MONUSCO. And so the task force is basically the operationalization of this mandate, and um, it gathers at the provincial level all relevant actors, representatives of the, the provincial justice authorities, uh, representatives of uh, international NGOs such as Trial International, local partners such as the, found, the Panzi Foundation, and the UN Galaxy, so several sections within MONUSCO, the Human Rights Office, which represents the Office of the High Commissioner, uh, and other UN agencies like, like UNDP. And concretely, this task force meets uh, very regularly, every other week, basically, to evaluate the progress of, of the cases, to discuss about the needs in each case, in terms of evidence gathering, in terms of planning of investigations and prosecutions, and in the end, uh, discusses how to best deploy complementary resources among all the partners within the task force. And um, 
the, the, the key to me is that there really cannot be an actor working on this in DRC outside of the task force. Everything goes through the task force. And within the task force, all the actors have to oftentimes come to compromise because maybe they have an agenda and the, the different agendas don't match, but they have to work jointly on the same cases because we have a, a blueprint, we have a prosecution strategy, this list of priority cases, and that's the direction everyone has to work uh, toward together. Uh, last ingredient, fifth and last ingredient, national capacity building. Throughout the years, um, China International and other actors have tried to uh, perfect a system of national capacity building that involves a bit of training programs, but also, more importantly, to echo what, what Eva was saying yesterday about enough with the training at a certain point, um, more importantly, mentoring programs. Mentoring uh, in the sense that basically the Congolese practitioners, NGOs, lawyers, magistrates, can work on actual cases with the experts within the task force. And so the experts within the task force can provide them with maybe access to international resources, best practices, working tools to facilitate their work. So that kind of engages them in a, in a, in a process of learning and also sharing among peers that is very uh, important. So th these are the, four, the, the five ingredients that I wanted to share with you. Now, before concluding, I, I cannot finish without acknowledging the, the enormous challenges that we still face in the ERC. So I'll just name a few. Uh, the fact that this positive dynamic I've described in South Kivu has um, unfortunately not been replicated as successfully in other provinces in the country. The fact that the number of cases dealt with is uh, insufficient compared with the number of crimes committed. Um, deficiencies in the uh, witness and victims' protection, ineffectiveness of, of judicial reparations awarded, lack of autonomy of the Congolese government, uh, financial autonomy, I mean, because they rely on the partners to foot the bill for investigations and, and, and prosecutions, imbalance between the military and the ordinary uh, jurisdictions in DRC, with the military jurisdictions taking the lead on these cases, and the ordinary jurisdictions lagging behind, still very shy to, 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 to deal with these complex uh, cases. So I could go on for, for hours about the challenges, but I wanted to focus a bit more on the positive, uh, let's say, success side of the equation, because I think that there are important lessons to be learned, and uh, it kind of provides a very tentative answer to the fundamental question of the nature of the future of ICL. I think that the DRC model is definitely can be categorized as a domestic model, but at the same time, as you've seen, there are very important international elements within it. And I think that under certain circumstances, this kind of uh, system can be um, uh, more sustainable definitely less expensive and, and more culturally appropriate and effective than, than international courts or even UJ cases. Um, so I'll stop here, but I'm glad to, to go into more details maybe about some cases in afterwards. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Daniele, for giving us all these ingredients for what could be a recipe for success uh, to obtain justice at, at the domestic level. I'll now turn to you, uh, Oreja Galabai. Um, you are an international lawyer, currently the special assistant to the register of the UN International Residual Mechanism for International Tribunals. And between 2018 and 2019, you have been the deputy lead counsel of the Gambia's Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission, the TR. RC. Um, and at the time today, Oreja, where the Gambian government is finalizing the roadmap um, on the implementation of the TRC uh, recommendations, and I think we've all seen this week 16 organizations, international and Gambian organizations, um, sending an open letter to the Gambian Ministry of Justice stating that the TRC recommendations should be followed by accountability. I would like to ask you, Oreja, from your work, inside the Commission. How do you think that this work could pave the way for effective domestic prosecution? The floor is yours. 
Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, let me begin by thanking the International Nuremberg Principles Academy for inviting me um, to this very ever relevant topic, but also very timely when I think about certainly, of course, Ukraine and other situations, but also for the Gambia. Um, we started with very positive, um, positive steps, to put it that way. We benefited from a lot of support. I mean, I see a lot of um, people who've been um, very much involved in the process. Reed Brody, Ambassador Rapp, Ambassador Skak, Van Skak. Um, quite a few people have been involved, and so we've had a lot of support um, as we've moved along, but this is quite a precarious moment for us right now. I will explain the reasons why, but again, it touches upon something that quite a few people have raised, which is political will. And the fact that political will is something that is fluid. So we began with a situation where the political will was there to, to deal with um, the international crimes that were committed. And now we're at a point where, certainly for me, I, I've changed my mind to some extent about the best process because I've noticed the implications that political will has and the long term, um, and putting in place a long term strategy bearing in mind that fluid, um, fluid process. So I will begin by first of all giving a very brief introduction to the situation that led to the change of government and the transitional justice processes. Many of you will remember the dramatic situation in the Gambia. So I'll briefly touch upon that because I think that is important when we then talk about what next in terms of the justice models. Um, certainly the involvement of ECOWAS, which I know OISO is very passionate about. Um, the Constitutional Review Commission came up with a draft which will address one of the issues that Ambassador Rapp is mo most concerned with in terms of um, prosecuting JAMI under the current constitution. Um, but I'll, the, mo the part of my presentation, most of it will focus on the Truth Commission itself. So its design, um, the powers it had, some of the operations. Um, but I will also mention a few national proceedings that were initiated as the Truth, um, Truth Commission was ongoing. I'll talk a little bit about, um, well, I will just mention, of course, what's happened in Germany, what's happening in the US as well as Switzerland. Um, but I will just end with a few observations, certainly from the experience. Um, and perhaps in terms of the way forward for the Gambia, some of the positive indications, but also the reality that we've talked about, certainly with the ingredients uh, mentioned by Danielle and Matez, in terms of what next and how do you actually ensure a successful accountability mechanism for criminal prosecutions going forward. Um, for me, certainly the issue of legal reforms is a very big one because we certainly have a lot of bills sitting in Parliament that would be the game changer for quite a few years. So it's great to see trainings, it's great to see that initiative, but again, if you have these very important bills that are key to the crimes, the, um, the modes of liability, the procedural safeguards, witness protection, for example, there is no bill that will put, um, put forward a proper progressive um, legal framework. So you have, for example, um, mandates that say protect victims and witnesses, but you don't have the legal framework to back that up. And so there are quite a few challenges in that regard. So I have quite a few things I'd like to touch upon, so I'll be very brief in relation to the many different issues, and I would invite you, of course, during questions um, to ask me for more information. So as many of you will recall, in December 2016, um, there was an election in the Gambia. It was a different kind of election because it was the first time that the opposition parties came together um, and formed a coalition. And it was the first time that actually the opposition won the election, so the Gambians supported the opposition. The opposition won. Surprisingly, the president immediately accepted. <laughs> then a week later, um, changed his mind and said there were, um, there were allegations of basically fraud and um, other issues that he pointed out. And so he refused to accept the results, which then plunged the country into an impasse. And at that point, it was a very different situation because Gambians had had enough. There were 22 years of dictatorship where a lot of human rights violations and abuses were committed. And so it was the first time that Gambians were openly defiant. 
um, basically saying the Gambia has decided was a, was a slogan. And so people said Gambia has decided for democracy, rule of law. There were all these different kinds of slogans. But people were out on the streets. People were openly defiant to a point where there was, um, there was an effect, a domino effect, because the Bar Association came out with a statement, various, um, various bodies and authorities came out with a statement, the Army Chief of Staff as well sort of said, I'm with the people. Um, there was a lot going on at the time, but there were a number of, ev um, number of events, I should say, or a number of factors that came together in a unique way, I think, that really, um, really helped in that sense to sort of support the Gambian people's position. So one important thing was that Senegal, our neighbor on three sides of the border, was a member of the Security Council at the time, of course, a non-permanent member. So Senegal called an emergency meeting, and so the Security Council also issued a statement. The African Union, as well, issued a statement. But it was ECOWAS that took the leading role. And so ECOWAS was engaged in negotiations and Oiso, I believe, mentioned this, right? ECOWAS has a strong position. I say strong position because I know what's happened subsequently, but still. ECOWAS does have a very strong pos position when it comes to um, unconsti unconstitutional changes in government, or um, at the very least at that point, the feeling that Gambians had decided, had voted for change, and we must respect that. So um, ECOWAS was engaged in, in the negotiations. Um, various um, West African leaders came to the Gambia, met with the president. And of course, during that time, while the impasse was going on, the president took certain steps that sort of made it a bit, um, it was a little scary at the time when people started leaving to go to Senegal, for example. So the president promoted members of the military. So you're thinking the army chief of staff came out and said we're with the people, but then you see the promotions of the military. Um, but there was relentless um, support from ECOWAS and people were just adamant. And so while some people left, people were still openly in the streets defiant, bringing down Jame posters. You would never have seen that in the 22 years. And so when that happened, eventually um, the, the Gambian, um, president-elect at the time, actually fled to Senegal as well. And so his swearing in took place in the Gambian embassy at the, um, at, in Senegal. And as soon as he was sworn in, he gave the um, authority for ECOWAS troops to come in. So ECOMIG is what they were called. And so they came in just as President Jame was leaving. So you can imagine, I believe it was a six week period of time, but there was a lot of tension. We weren't sure where it was going, but we had very strong, Gambians were very strong and adamant in their defiance, but we also had the support of the international community. And I think that's important, especially of West Africa, because you cannot do this alone. So Gambians could have been defiant all we wanted, and if ECOWAS did not take a very strong position, eventually things would have changed. Um, and the reality is there would have been no intervention. Jame would probably still be president. Um, so I think that's important because that then put in place a new government. And that new government, again, we had um, very impressive Gambians from the international criminal law, um, international criminal justice circuit. So we had a new minister of justice, um, Abubakar Tambadu, who, was, um, who worked at the international ICTR and then worked for the mechanism after, the MICT. Um, then we had Hassan Jalo, who became the Chief Justice. And so there are certainly Gambians who were in the right positions at the right time. Um, and I think that's very important, because while the coalition government made a campaign promise to, um, to initiate a truth, um, truth commission, the Justice Minister was very, very adamant and strong about the kind of transitional justice process that we're going to have. So there was a launch of um, a truth commission, a constitutional review commission. We've had so many changes to our constitution that it's not even clear which version is the right one. <laughs> that's, that's how bad it got. Um, there was a national human rights commission that was initiated, um, as well as a JANA commission to look into the financial aspects. Um, I point that out, like I said, because I'll come back to certainly ECOWAS and the Constitutional Review Commission. 
And so the, t the Truth Commission, the Truth Reconciliation and Reparations Commission, was launched on the 15th of October 2018. So it had a mandate of two years initially, um, but because of COVID and um, requiring additional time to complete the report, eventually it took three years. And so during that time, over the course of two and a half years of hearings, exactly 871 days of hearings, um, we heard about 400 witnesses, so 392 to be exact. And there were regional hearings away from the capital, which was great. There were nationwide outreach activities. There was a diaspora tour to the US and Europe. Um, there were women's listening circles. There were other activities that involved a lot of um, psychosocial support to victims, exhumations, um, site visits, um, reconciliation and reparations. So perhaps let me just say that by definition, as we all know, transitional justice processes are an imperfect response to the situation at hand. There is no way to um, investigate and prosecute every single violation. And so you're starting out with an imperfect system and a lot of stakeholders that have different views, different um, priorities within that system. So uh, for me, certainly when, I, when it comes to designing and um, putting together a, an accountability mechanism um, of any sort, it has to be rooted in the specific context of the situation at hand. And that's not to say that we can't learn and take from other systems, but there should be that willingness to adapt and make certain changes. Um, and certainly in my experience at the Gambia, there were times where there were international partners who were very open to us having it the way we wanted to design it. And so they were supportive, and so they would highlight issues like, are you sure about X and Y? Because this may lead to a number of other issues. So they would take that approach of, we'll give you room, I believe, to do what you want to do, but have you thought of X, Y, and Z? But there were certainly individuals from um, either it's NGOs or um, I didn't have, I didn't experience this with governments, but certainly with some NGOs where it was as if, um, because the experience had been in certain specific contexts, their view was that that was the best way to approach it. Um, whereas in the Gambia, we had very, I guess very strong and determined people in certain positions that just thought this is going to be a Gambian process and we are going to do it the way we want to do it. One example is um, with the selection of commissioners. So in Gambia, for the Truth Commission, we did not follow a more traditional selection, at least in terms of other commissions in the Gambia, but instead we chose more of a, um, a jury approach to commissioners. So they're commissioners from all um, regions of the Gambia, all seven regions, as well as the diaspora. We had um, religious leaders. The main faiths are Islam and Christianity, so we had both sides. Obviously, there was um, a focus on male and female commissioners, uh, members of the civil society, um, but, in, but the selection was really based on nominations from the Gambian people. So in a particular region, um, you'd have the community determining who they wanted to represent them at the commission. And so we ended up with some commissioners who, for example, did not speak English, um, and so could not read and write in English. That's perfectly fine. That represents a lot of Gambian society as well. Um, we had... Um, we had commissioners who did not have much experience in terms of um, regional government or just certain issues that um, would, um, would allow them, for, ex for instance, to understand some of the proceedings or what was going on. So we decided to then have a legal team to support the, um, the commissioners. That was seen as very controversial from the outset. And it was, and, and I can understand this um, temptation of whenever you include lawyers, you, you're concerned that the process will become too legal, as opposed to a truth commission that has its own dynamics, even if you have legal elements. So that was one big um, concern. It was something that um, a lot of civil society actors pushed against initially. Um, but I think as time went on, there was more acceptance, even though, of course, as the proceedings went on, for certain hearings, it seemed more adversarial. And so that made some people uncomfortable, certainly when it came to um, alleged perpetrators. Um, another example was reparations. 
Of course, reparations is a very difficult issue to put in a commission's mandate. Um, you're most likely to fail. <laughs> because it's, it's one of those things that you can't um, adequately provide. It's complicated. There's also a lot of misunderstanding around reparations where people think of payments, right, only, um, compensation. But of course, reparations has these five components that look at um, various issues. Um, so that was one, one big issue that um, a lot of international actors advised us against, but based on nationwide tours around the country, this is something that Gambians really wanted. And in the end, at least in my opinion, it's something that gave the Commission more, um, more legitimacy. Because for a lot of Gambians, they thought, it's, you're spending a lot of money on this commission and establishing the truth, but what about the victims? What are you doing about the victims? And so whenever we could explain what we're doing in terms of reparations, how we're responding to the needs of victims, that always tempered people down. Um, I saw that in the Gambia through various outreach activities. I saw that in the US, because um, I was part of the group that went to the US and we visited um, about four states. But I saw that whenever we responded with what the reparations um, unit was doing, there was much more ease and they felt, okay, so you're doing a lot of good work. <laughs> it wasn't just establishing the truth, as important as that was, but they felt that immediate need to respond to victims. And some of these victims were faced human rights violations 22 years ago. Quite a few people had passed as well. Some of them were children at the time. Um, and so that was quite important. Um, but just very briefly, in terms of um, the mandate, as many of you know, it was between July 1994 and January 2017, so 22-year um, period. A lot of the um, violations we looked at were torture, unlawful killing, sexual and gender-based violence, enforced disappearance, disappearance sorry, um, inhumane and degrading treatment, um, a lot of arbitrary arrest and detention without trial because of course it was a tool to, um, uh, to um, go against journalists, to go against opposition forces, so um, there were a lot of violations. But coming from um, an international criminal law perspective, I was at the ICC for over 14 years, I appreciate a lot of different things about a truth commission because of the broad scope. Um, for instance, one of our mandates was to promote healing and reconciliation. You know, that was a core mandate. Um, in fact, it was the first thing that was listed in the Act, the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Act 2017. Respond to the needs of the victims. That was one of the, um, the mandates of the Commission. And so I certainly had experiences where you had sexual and gender-based violence victims who did not want to give a statement, who did not want to um, participate in hearings, but were able to still give them psychosocial support, medical assistance as required, because that was one of our key mandates. It wasn't that because we weren't using them in the hearings, we had no responsibility or obligation towards them. It was quite the contrary. Um, the Commission, though, had certain very key um, mandates, so such as making recommendations for prosecutions um, of those who bear the greatest responsibility, recommendations for amnesties, again, a controversial one, as always. Um, but particularly in our context, where 22 years of dictatorship really affected the system that we had, um, destabilized institutions, weakened them, or used institutions in ways that they weren't um, supposed to be. One of the recommendations was to establish, um, to establish appropriate preventive mechanisms and um, recommend institutional and legal reforms. So I, I certainly appreciate that broader approach um, to, um, to, a, to a situation of um, gross human rights violations and abuses, international crimes. Um, and certainly as a first step before moving on to prosecutions. Um, another, um, another important thing wasn't just the mandate um, itself, but the powers that the commission was given. So while designing the commission, um, Gambians went on two study tours, um, in particular to South Africa and to Sierra Leone. And so the Truth, Reconciliation, Reparations Act itself had certain powers that really made it much easier for the Commission to do its work. Um, extensive powers, really. Um, ability to conduct search and seizures, subpoenas, um, to refer to the High Court and whenever <laughs> contempt occurred. Um, um, what's it called? Receiving, requesting and receiving police assistance. Um, 
granting, um, granting reparations as well, that was another one. But I think, importantly, these extensive powers allowed the commission to do its work. So it's, it's good to have that authority on paper and in a framework, but even more important, we had the support of the Ministry of Justice. And so there were many times in the actual operations where um, there was the potential for the commission to be weakened, either because a witness came to the commission and refused um, to testify. There was one big incident where a witness came and um, invoked his constitutional immunity, um, Yanko Bature, and refused to testify. And so we referred that matter um, to the Ministry of Justice and they proceeded to bring it to court. Um, it, it was a bit tricky because I think what was envisaged is that in such a situation, contempt would be clear, and so you'd just refer it to the High Court for punishment. Um, but actually, when it went to the High Court, the High Court actually wanted the entire thing to be litigated in front of it. Um, and so initially, when they dismissed it, the Justice Ministry decided, we will proceed to then charge you with the crimes that we believe you've committed. And so having a very strong justice ministry to support the Truth Commission, to support um, its work is, um, is indispensable because if nothing happened to that person, we would have more people coming to the commission, refusing to either testify or invoking um, constitutional immunity and nothing would happen to them. Um, so I think that was very important. How am I doing for time? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was very important. Um, Yes, having a very strong justice ministry um, is, is something that you can't do with. Another aspect of the Gambian situation was, I mentioned the change in government. So we had people at the top who um, were either from the opposition um, party or were from outside the diaspora and so came back home. We had a few people who were from the former government. Um, so at least in terms of political will at the top, it was there. Um, there was a lot of support for the commission. Um, the government gave money for reparations. Of course, not enough. Um, but there was a lot of support. Um, but one difficulty was a lot of the other institutions stayed the same. And so you had alleged perpetrators, especially in the security forces. Um, the National Intelligence Agency, at one point, they were trying to destroy evidence. <laughs> we. Um, we got there, we found out about it, and so we halt um, the destruction of certain documents, and um, that's something that was addressed in the Commission's report. Um, but you certainly had people in the system who had every interest of stopping us from doing our work. And so, uh, one thing I didn't mention is the Gamb uh, Truth Commission was staffed by Gambians. Um, I recall only one person who was non-Gambian who came from South Africa and was helping build capacity for psychosocial um, support because we had people with some experience in counseling, but we certainly needed that additional um, expertise. And the approach was always to get it from the diaspora if no one in country had it. Um, but for that particular one, I guess no one from the diaspora wanted to come down, and so we had a South African who was assisting. But because the commission was 99% Gambian, one of the things were, um, we knew the players, we knew the people in the security um, system, we knew how to speak to other Gambians to get inside knowledge on those individuals. And so that really helped in knowing who to go to, how to bypass certain people. Um, we had certain police officers in the, in the Truth Commission itself. There was no lustration process, so we essentially did it ourselves to some extent, at least to facilitate our work, but just from that knowledge, um, having intimate knowledge of the country, having intimate knowledge of the people. And I think that was very important because one of the key um, aspects of the commission was um, requesting and receiving police assistance. So you have to be extremely careful with the police. We had the Inspector General of Police who was um, very supportive and, um, and so that was helpful, but we knew which individual police officers to avoid. We knew, um, we just knew from the police officers at the commission and talking to other people how to go about our work. So we would find out, for instance, the national intelligence when they tried to get rid of certain documents because they said they were renovating and <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that. But that's an example. Um, also, because the commission was staffed predominantly by Gambians, including Gambians from the diaspora, there was a combination of 
intimate knowledge and those who also had distance from the situation, which I think was very useful. Um, but that's the only reason why we're able to start hearings within three months of launching the commission. That's unprecedented, you know? It's, it's a very difficult situation to be in, but of course it also created problems for us. As soon as you start, you launch the commission. It's great because Gambians were, quite a few Gambians were also skeptical about the need for a truth commission because they felt we didn't have a war, why do we need this commission? Um, and some people felt you want to address sexual and gender-based violence, this is a predominantly Muslim country. No one is going to come forward in this very small country to talk about sexual violence. So there was a lot of reservations for different reasons, but as soon as we launched, um, there was a lot of support from the public, um, from international partners, the funding also came in a lot more once we started. There were televised hearings, um, people were able to follow what was happening. Um, so being able to do that was really key because of course the funding came, everyone, everything was going well. But once we launched the hearings, it was impossible to stop and take a proper break to really advance investigations. And so for me, certainly as a lawyer, I was used to investigations being conducted first, you get the bulk of your case, um, how you frame it, um, case preparation, then you go into court or wherever it is. And in this instance, um, we had to investigate various themes simultaneously and present ev um, evidence in the hearings. This was really challenging. Um, and there were times where um, we had to delay the presentation of certain kinds of evidence for many reasons. Um, Similarly with witness protection, there were just a lot of challenges because we felt like we're always trying to catch up because things were moving on, but then while we're de dealing with that challenge, there was a lot of support. So when I mentioned Yanko Bature who came before the commission and refused to testify, Gambians were upset because they felt he was disrespected, disrespecting them. So it wasn't about us working at the commission, it wasn't about the commissioners, but they felt so much ownership of the process that the feeling was I, he came and he disrespected us. That's unacceptable. That was really the view that people had. So it's just to make, um, go to Prosecutor Khan's comment about justice is better when it is close to the victims um, and victims feel ownership of it. There are challenges, um, for sure. So perhaps let me just um, end with a couple of points about um, where we go from now. Um, well, before that, perhaps in term, just the comment about the televised proceedings. So what we had were, we're able to show a lot of um, evidence that also spurred on proceedings in other countries. Germany, um, Prosecutor Gemmel talked about using evidence that was found on the internet. Um, certainly in the US it spurred action as well, um, as well as Switzerland. While Switzerland were also um, proceeding with some of their investigations, but the problem was we had this televised and so we were able to provide evidence to other people, but a lot of these other proceedings are not ones we have access to. And so the commission can only look at um, a number of issues, it's a limited mandate, but there's all this evidence being generated by other jurisdictions that we don't really have access to. Um, and I think that's a problem because we also have similar concerns of witness protection, we have um, concerns of consent of victims, but I, I at least had one experience where a particular um, rape victim wanted the commission to testify, and then uh, wanted to testify at the commission, perfect, <laughs> wanted to testify at the commission, and she had consented to us getting her statement from um, a particular international organization, and we had conveyed that um, message, and you know she was copied in the email, but it was taking so long to get that statement that in the end she came and she said, I'll just give you the latest draft copy I have, and <laughs> we can work with that. So in the end, uh, the witness had consented, but it was taking a while for the NGO to give us that information for whatever reason. But there was also this thing of a lot of Gambians also wanted to um, testify before the Gambian Commission because that meant something different for them. And so she provided the statement and um, in the end that was good because it avoided us re-interviewing a rape victim before then um, putting her on the stand. And I think that's really important, especially for vulnerable victims, because we really need to avoid this repetitive, um, repetitive um, statement taking process. Um, one thing about the different models is initially, certainly my view was to have a hybrid model 
um, or specialized um, chamber within the national system because I felt that capacity had been built from, for example, the Truth Commission, um, and you can certainly get more expertise and um, people supporting a national process, um, a system within the national, uh, national system, but because of the politics. Now the government is currently engaged with the former regime. They've appointed two former Jamia loyalists as the Speaker of the National Assembly and the Deputy. So there's a lot of uncertainty about whether or not things will go ahead. So the ECOWAS model for me is something I can touch upon later, but I, it's more attractive now in many ways um, for many different reasons um, to do it independence as well. And the lack of um, certain bills being moved, you know, using TRC evidence, like I mentioned, witness protection, things like that. Um, so that's something I can touch upon during um, question and answer, but also, um, Lastly, just to say, um, yeah, um, I guess it comes back to when you're designing a model, design one that can withstand it, the test of time as much as possible, right? Um, one of the other issues for me is if we need a, um, a hybrid model supported by ECOWAS, the, only, the main issue is really about if, we, uh, if the political will stays the same, the main issue is really about charging JAMI. And the, new, the old constitution requires two-thirds majority. Because of the shift in political allegiance, that may not be possible right now, even though there is some political analysis to be said about how um, that has changed to some extent because they didn't get as much success from JAMI's support as was expected. But the new draft constitution does remove that provision and makes it very easy to prosecute a former head of state. Um, the issue that the current president had with the new draft um, constitution was it would have limited his term. Um, so there's the two-term issue, but he, his first term would have counted. And something that was something he was against, and so he was able to sway political support away from passing the draft constitution. So it might be um, possible now. We don't know, but that's something to look at. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Orenja. I particularly liked, I must say, the notion of fluidity of the political will, a notion on which we could do maybe a whole conference, um, and also the importance of the ownership, of course, of any um, solution for accountability. We can draw uh, common characteristics, ingredients, as we were saying, but the ownership is, of course, key to finding a, um, a specific solution that is also driven by the society where the crimes have taken place. Um, I leave it now to to you, to the audience, for questions, discussion, comments, because I think there's been a lot of very interesting issues raised, and um, we have maybe 35 minutes now for these questions and answers and discussions. So the floor is yours. Oh, it's on. Uh Okay, uh, thank you for a very wonderful presentation, all of you. Uh, I've been a lot the whole morning, so, you know, <laughs> fast panels are always good. So, uh, I mean, I've been uh, conducting research on the Kosovo Specialist Chambers in the European Union for three and a half years now, and uh, if you've dealt with uh, anything related to the European Union, you would know that information is hard to come by. People don't talk over there, so it's quite interesting. You know, today I had a conversation with David Schwendemann in the morning, very brief, and I had all loads of information that I wish I had when I started my research. And just so uh, I'm just wondering, you know, if you could comment on how exactly did you manage to get the EU Commission on board? Because as you've said, as I'm aware, they were not very enthusiastic about it. Because, and um, we've had this a few, a couple of weeks ago, I was having a conversation with the ICJ, Sam Zarifi, ICJ president, and the same issue with the Council of Europe. There's little imagination with, you know, at the bureaucratic level, because they believe that they don't quite have the legal mandate to do this. They look at the law and they're like, well, this would be stretching it a bit too far. So how then did you get the EU Commission to climb down and actually appreciate that they do indeed have the legal mandate to do this? So that, that's the same thing you know, that currently the Council of Europe is struggling with. Some believe at the political level, if you look at the resolution that was passed recently, at the political level they believe, well, we can, because politicians simply say, oh, do you think we can? Yes, we can pass this. Then the bureaucrats are like, mm, kind of legally dicey. So how do you convince these legal bureaucrats to be legally imaginative and actually use the law that they have? So your experience with the EU Commission, how did you get them to appreciate that? Then, because I won't come back here, let me just do a round of all the questions I have, then I, I go away. <laughs> 
So, Von Sa, um, thank you for the presentation. I just have one uh, question. Uh, when, when you get, when you get uh, persons extradited from states such as the Netherlands, and I think you're in studies here who has been doing that, what sort of um, arrangements do you have with the states on how they monitor this? Or do they just, you know, um, dump the suspects on you and then say, take it from there, we have nothing left to do with it? Or is there some sort of arrangement on them? For instance, if you're in studies, send somebody back to Rwanda. And I think yesterday, uh, they arrested somebody who will be coming to you, Vonsa, quite soon. So what sort of arrangements do you uh, normally have with them? Um, on, do they monitor, do they follow it up from there or it ends when they put the person on the plane or something? And, and then Horija, I would, cause I'm, cause I, I would like you to help me with a little <laughs> bit of my research. So quite looking forward to your comments specifically on how ECOWAS might get involved and all that. So yeah, thanks. That's all for now. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe you can respond to this first series of questions and then open up the floor again. Um, always so I, can, I do this as quickly as I can. Um, Ambassador Rapp is probably as responsible as anybody for getting the EU Commission to finally realize that it was something that they could and should do. Um, again, the political side was fully supportive, I think. Um, the administrative side, not so much, and their concerns were expanding the Lisbon to reach into this new area for them, which was courts and, and uh, mechanisms for holding people accountable in a criminal way for conduct that they committed in the past and even in the future. I mean, they weren't really interested in, in creating that kind of a system. So I think one of the things that was useful was this hybrid nature of what it ended up being, which was a Kosovo court essentially paid for by the European Union. That presents a couple of challenges and it was, it, they're challenges that are challenges in the reality of that, not in the conceptual nature of it. If you give the European Union the task of supporting financially this system, this mechanism, you give it an enormous amount of power with regard to the independence of those institutions. For example, it's at one point the European Commission was not happy with my staff and were with their contracts. And the European Commission decided that uh, they were going to terminate all of the contracts of my staff and then recontract with them on less favorable terms. And their point to me was, if they don't like it, go let them find another job. We'll find people that don't want to take this work. It's not a problem. Well, that was three years, three and a half years into the process, three and a half years invested in the case, three and a half years of collecting evidence and analyzing it, familiarity with the facts, knowing where the holes were, knowing where what needed to be done needed to be done. And more importantly, because we were dealing with people that Dick Marti had promised some anonymity and had promised not to reveal in exchange for the information that they, they gave him, we were having to delicately work with people to try and get them back on board with the idea that they would eventually perhaps have to testify in a trial, which implicated witness protection, which further complicated the commission's commitment to all of this. When we went to them with uh, needs as far as witness protection was concerned, it was, whoa, we agreed to set up these institutions. Witness protection, you're gonna be on your own in a lot of respects when it comes to that. So then we became diplomats going from embassy to embassy and using all the good auspices of different nations to try and convince them to take on people that in some respects were criminals. They were uh, people that had, may have committed murder on instructional orders from people that we were most interested in as subjects. Um, try that on someplace like Denmark or Norway or Sweden. Hey, I've got a deal for you. I've got this guy who killed a bunch of people, but we need him as a witness. So will you take him, his family, and everybody that he's associated with? And 
find him a job, put him in a house, give him immigration status, and uh, oh yeah, uh, put a police detail on him 24 hours a day, partly so he doesn't kill somebody else, <laughs> and so that he doesn't get killed himself. <laughs> and, they, and they say, well, who's going to pay? Um, and then we go back to this, this process. So what I'm saying, Uisu, is they were generous, and they came through. They came through because they, I think, realized that it had to be done, and it had to be done the right way, and frankly, because the United States said, look, you really need to do this. Um, with Kosovo, it became kind of a, a situation where, I think, Steve, if I'm not mistaken, we threatened them with the U going to the UN and getting the UN to do something uh, to create this. And even go along with the Russians. Yeah, yeah, and even go along with the Russians to, to get them to do it in some sort of, in a way like was done with the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. That threw Kosovo into a tizzy because they did not want to get the UN involved in it, so they were willing to accept uh, the EU's involvement and support. So I, again, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of finesse. It's a matter of um, pressure, and it's a matter of support from people in the commission who really did want to see it happen. And frankly, we got some good support from the U, the head of ULEX at at one point towards the end. So uh, ULEX is another uh, part of this entirely. ULEX was not really happy about giving up this uh, mandate. And this goes to something that's very important about having internationals involved in anything. A lot of that is, is I want a job work. Uh, I want to keep a job. So I'm going to do what I need to do in order to keep myself in the position. I'm kind of liking what I'm making. I'm kind of liking where I am. I'm kind of liking the exotic nature of the work. And um, I may or may not be producing all that much, but uh, you know I'm comfortable. So don't try and do away with me. Don't try and uh, create another mechanism that will replace me. And that's a fight you will often have when you're trying to bring it back to the region and back to the nation where these things happened. Now, I will say, we went into Bosnia and Herzegovina not with any intention that we were going to stay. I think I went in with the idea that I was going to do myself out of a job and I was going to do all I could to deliver it back to the national ownership, and I was going to respect what they wanted as much as what we knew international standards expected of them. And so there was this collaboration that happened. There wasn't so much any of that in the Kosovo uh, situation, uh, but there were a lot of international standards that were built into what was done by the international community to get that set up. So I guess that's the best I can say. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, the question is about the arrangement between Rwanda and uh, the uh, suspect. Uh, it depends on case by case. Uh, for some countries, we do sign a memorandum of understanding uh, in relation to how we are going to treat uh, the suspect once he's uh, extradited to Rwanda. It is about like uh, a fair trial guarantees, uh, the guarantees in relation to the, uh, the detention facilities, and how the suspect is going to be visited by his family, and so and so on. It, it depends on country, but with, uh, case by case. Like for the case, uh, uh, for the situation of the Netherlands, we normally sign uh, a, a, an agreement uh, whereby we accept monitors to, to regularly visit those people where they are detained in Rwanda. There is uh, a, some people from Kenya, from your country, who on a regular basis visit uh, whenever they want to meet uh, uh, the Rwandan prosecutors, uh, prison officers, the suspect where he's detained in prison, they do that and they are, they are free, very free to do that and they do that very regularly. In some other countries, 
they just send the, the, the suspect and uh, there, there is no such uh, monitoring process in place. But they do monitor themselves through their uh, diplomatic missions like Denmark. Uh, uh, I can give you an example. Last month, the ambassador of Denmark in, uh, in Rwanda attended a court hearing for two days and uh, the hearing was also uh, attended by journalists from uh, Denmark and they could take video and photo and everything uh, in order to uh, go back to their country and show how transparent trials are, are, are being conducted. Uh, in some other countries, they just deport uh, and <laughs> they, they show up. <laughs> They, they just deport, and uh, uh, there is no follow-up. We just apply the guarantees, and uh, the, uh, we just comply with human rights and uh, international conventions with regard to the treatment of prisoners, and, uh, uh, and so on and so on. So it depends on case by case. Thank you. All right, Judge, you want to provide a quick, make quick answer to the yes. You had a question. Yes, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, this was very rich. I have just two very brief questions. Uh, one is for Daniela, and the other one is for Vincent. So, uh, Daniela, you mentioned that the situation was much more positive in South Kivu. So, I was just wondering if you can briefly outline why maybe that isn't so in, in other uh, regions. And for Vincent, as a historian, I want to ask what's going on with the Gachacha archives? Are they digitized? Is there planning to digitize them? What is kind of the accessibility for research to the extent that you know, of course, uh, uh, maybe you can tell me also privately later more, more, more details, but I'm very curious about the archives. Thank you. Daniele? Uh, it's a great question. We, we're trying to work in other provinces to make, to, to make sure that the, the lessons learned can be replicated. I think that there is an institutional weakness in terms of, uh, for instance, the UN system, in terms of drawing from internal good uh, um, good practices. Sometimes the, the, there's not such a good flow of communication between the different units and the, the logistical challenges between uh, working in South Kivu and, for instance, working in Kasai, that is another province that was afflicted by con conflict um, a few years ago, but they're very distant. So you have to take three planes to get to Kasai. <laughs> and so um, there's, there's a little bit of that. And I think there's a little bit of inertia and the difficulty of also the national justice system to create some uh, national champions that can then go to other provinces and, and make it work over there. Because the, um, the transfer of the, the magistrates around um, by the national authorities is not always dictated by the specialization and the competence that they have acquired throughout the years, but sometimes it's more of uh, pragmatic or political reasons, and that weakens the system, so that we have uh, managed to establish this, this uh, a really nice core of expertise in South Kivu, with a lot of magistrates that have been there for a while, 
and and the challenge is yeah to replicate that institutionally with also in terms of the the right persons to export that in in different provinces it's been a challenge yeah. thank you very much for the question uh, there are millions of uh, physical documents uh, of gachacha and uh, the, the digitalization has already started but uh, it is not yet finished. So uh, for somebody to have access, you need to write to the ministry in charge of uh, those uh, archives. And it is the ministry of uh, Ubumwe. Ubumwe in, um, in Kenya Rwanda is uh, unity. It is called like this. It has been put in place uh, some, some, some months ago in order to promote the reconciliation between the, the Rwandans. So the access is possible. You, you need to send a request to that ministry. Uh, but for investigators and uh, prosecutors, those who uh, we work together, we closely together, foreign prosecutors from Germany, Canada, England, they can, uh, we assist them. Uh, as their counterpart in Rwanda, we assist them to, to, to have the access by requesting, uh, sending a request to the Minister of Ubumwe. But uh, if you want, don't hesitate to come to us. We, we will assist you. Mm. Thank you, Vincent. Ambassador Rapp, you had a question or a comment, yes. maybe? Uh, I have a question for Daniel, but first, just a comment. A great panel, and, and I really appreciate uh, David's uh, insights, which I think uh, awaken us to the fact that working sometimes with international organizations, and that includes the United Nations, in establishing sort of ideal tribunals, uh, brings you into structures that are really not created to work in, in a judicial process or a prosecution process. And you end up with a lot of bureaucratic and personnel rules, uh, a lot of people that don't really care whether your witnesses get there that day or, or next week. And, and I know Navi had her experiences at the beginning of the, of the ICTR and the challenges of actually creating a court. And, and doing it every time, and obviously doing it in this case, the first time with the EU, EU in, in this sense, uh, I, I can imagine was, was enormously challenging. Um, so uh, it's another thing that I think makes us awake to the importance of domestic processes, because there you have court systems that are established, logistical <laughs> systems. Uh, you may not have purpose wit witness protection, but you've got court security. Uh, you know, you have something that's there, a whole system that's developed over the course of decades and centuries uh, to deal with, with, with violent criminals and, and others, and, and to some extent working in that process, if you can bring the international justice in and get past the legal and political issues, I think is, is something much, uh, much to be sought. Uh, but um, I wanted to focus specifically with Danielle on, on, on Congo, on the Democratic Republic of Congo. Talk about my travels. I went there 15 times. and. Uh, and uh, all over the place, but constantly to Parliament and, and became uh, associated with the mixed chamber idea, uh, something that largely came out of Navi's uh, uh, mapping report uh, from 2010, rather controversial, uh, I know, uh, with, with some elements, but, but something that pointed to this profound uh, justice deficit uh, in the Congo and questions about political interference and the ability to reach high-level actors or actors that had powerful connections even abroad and, and the need for some internationalization. And uh, for political reasons, even though I had commitments from everyone from the president to the speaker of, the par of each house of parliament, uh, we could never get that done. <laughs> now we eventually went to the Central African Republic and we actually got a, a mixed chamber. Uh, now you're telling me, of course, that you know, we've made some very good progress in the Congolese system, working nationally with internationals, working closely with them. And I'm interested in, in you know, what, what that really takes and, it may, and whether maybe that's a better approach, because to be frank, and I'm, I know maybe Clemence and others could, could speak to it, I think the experience thus far in the, in the Central African Republic with the Special Court has been disappointing <laughs> to those of us that have supported it. And it's been very slow and sclerotic and sort of bureaucratized, where at least in the Congo I had the sense when we were doing the, the mobile justice on sexual violence, et cetera, that particularly working with the military system, 
it was possible to have a very <laughs> relatively simplified system that people could understand that didn't have all of these sort of layers that sort of a classical civil law system would have, but still had the benefit of, of, of a, basically a civil law proceeding or procedure. And I'm interested in your insights, and I'm also am interested in whether you mentioned the involvement of MINUSCO. When I was there, we had the establishment of the prosecution support cells, this embedding of internationals, eventually up to 30 all over the country. It worked some places where they were actually able to get in and work together. In other places, they were largely outside. And then there were also the, the feather betters, the vacationers, though DRC is not a place most people go to vacation. But you know, you would get people that really weren't very hard workers. And so uh, in the end, I began to think we really, uh, we're, we're thinking too much about internationalization <laughs> and, and, and our focus maybe should have been intensely on the national system and, and, and moving forward in that way. But I'm interested in your perspective about uh, uh, from, from trial about this idea of internationalization, mixed courts, etc. whether that's a, a useful way to go or whether we really should focus all our, our attention on, on exclusively national institutions with international assistance. Thanks a lot. It's a, it's a very complex question and I think it's... Let me, let me try to untangle it a little bit. I think that, the, that there was a momentum, politically speaking, in the DRC when there was a lot of discussion about the possibility of, of enacting the law on, on the mixed chambers. I think that then this political will vanished in the last years of the Kabila government. Now there's been a revival under Chisekedi because the new government has been very adamant in promoting at least um, engaging itself with the transitional justice process. And within that, in the accountability pillar, there has been a revival of ideas about the necessity of an international tribunal or an internationalized uh, mixed chambers, specialized chambers. In the last few years, uh, Dr. Denis Mukwege was, he, he has all, also been very proactively calling for the establishment of such an internationalized mechanisms. We have mixed feelings about that. Let me explain. I think that for some reasons and for certain situations, the idea of an internationalized mechanism is really important and I think that would be the only way to, to deal with most of the crimes that were documented in the mapping report. Because all of the progress um, by the domestic judicial authorities has been on crimes committed after 2003. For the crimes committed between 1993 2003, the crimes documented in the mapping report, zero prosecution. There's only one case that is active in France, according to the uh, university jurisdiction now, since last year. Otherwise, in Congo, it's, it's really impossible to get there for political reasons and for difficult logistical reasons in terms of also accessing evidence or maybe suspects from, from foreign countries. And so in that particular respect, I think that it might be worthwhile considering setting up something of an international or internationalized nature. What I'm really afraid of is that if there is such uh, an international focus and attention on that and resources devoted to that, that we lose the progress at the national level and the ownership that anyway the, the, the Congolese justice system is trying little by little to acquire. So, that's, I think, my answer. So I'm, I'm, I'm very open to the idea of, having, of adding another layer, but that shouldn't be uh, something that takes away the, the little developments that have been uh, made at the domestic level. So the... Thank you, Daniele. Reid, you had a question, comment? Sure, a comment and a question. First of all, I want to say that for those uh, who don't know, the TRRC in Gambia, and, and in part thanks to Hereja and her office, was one of the most amazing truth commissions in history. Um, you know, this was, um, for, for two years, people in Gambia 
um, when they're important witnesses. I mean, anywhere you went in town, you would hear in shops people listening to the radio or on their TV, they had perpetrators, they had killers, they had sexual violence, vic very courageous sexual violence victims. Um, it was really, and it was conducted really well. I mean, you guys, it was like watching the Watergate hearings or something. It was like really, it was, it was eminently watchable, the whole thing. And it was translated simultaneously in or consecutively into local languages as well. So anyway, um, uh, the, as you said, uh, the TRC came out with recommendation that Yaya Jame and 59 other people be prosecuted. And um, that was, and for the last couple of years, the Bar Association uh, has been convening a process to look at how those prosecutions should take place. And that's when Stephen Rapp took his pirogue and, and uh, many of us have been very involved in that. And, um, you asked about ECOWAS, and, and the, the, the governing consensus um, is uh, that a, a hybrid setup with ECOWAS um, would both provide the, the resources and, and the knowledge base, but also take it out of the system and allow you to have a statute and allow you to use international rules and allow you to have televised trials and all the things that you can purpose build a court, uh, a court system for. Um, the reason ECOWAS also is because the worst massacre of the Yaya Jame period was actually 59 West African migrants um, who were killed, um, who they beached in Gambia and they were thought to be mercenaries uh, or I don't know why, but um, for, and they were all, uh, 58 of, 59 of them were killed, one escaped. Um, but that brings in Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo. So there's the thought that that would enhance a regional political dynamic that, as Hereja said, if 15 countries are asking for Yaya Jame's prosecution, uh, Equatorial Guinea, I mean, even though we've seen the president of Equatorial Guinea and, and Yaya Jame dancing together and buddy buddy, you know, it's gonna, the bar is very high. Um, um, but, um, you know, that's, um, that's what everybody was thinking, even the Minister of Justice has talked about a, but as Hereja said, I mean, everything was called into question a couple of weeks ago when two JAMA loyalists were appointed to very key positions in the middle of everything. So there's more a comment than anything. Thank you. Do you want to react on this, Hereja? No, okay. Um, <laughs> Is there anyone else having a question, a comment? Do you all want to go desperately, hungry. yeah, hungry and desperately want to go to lunch? <laughs> well, I think we'll conclude there and I want to thank you all. Thank the panelists, of course, for again, these very rich and interesting uh, presentations today on this important thematic and subject. I think we have all food for thought um, in terms of uh, magical recipes, maybe, um, to <laughs> continue being innovative in the future. Um, thank you all and uh, yeah, we can continue the discussions during the lunch break. Thank you. Thank you.